ông quay cho ក្នុងកម្មការនៃទិធិសមនាការនៅព្រឹកនេះកម្មការសមនាការពិភាក្សានៃដោលចំពោះអ្នកចំនាញដោយវិធីធិតលើនឹងបន្តតាំងទំន
มนตรีฉบับจนปุ๊บจบทั้งไอทีเราประมวยใครกกระดาฉนำปีปอนดอปีคือไอกาซาอีมารอยเฉดปีสลับมาพบุญสลับบุญสลับบุญตรองกระทักันที่ปรำสมเชยดูสไลจักรมจักรมสมบัติมนุษย์ The chamber gave a ruling yesterday to the new and cheer defence team which reflected one given earlier to the Yang Sari team confirming that documents which are tendered as new documents pursuant to internal rule 87.4 must still meet the requirements of that rule but noting that the contents of those documents might be used when formulating questions to the experts. Uh, it has become clear that, <coughs> the very that a very large number of um, documents have been uploaded onto the daily trial interface uh, as part of the advanced courtesy copies that the uh, trial chamber require. This uh, <coughs> tends to make the, uh, the ruling in relation to Rule 87.4 uh, and the use to which other documents can be put uh, rather useless. Uh, therefore, the Chamber wishes to confirm that the provisions of Rule 87.4 remain in force. No document can be used by the Chamber in considering its verdict unless it has been put before the Chamber in compliance with all of the provisions of Rule 87, including that of Sub-Rule 4, which relates to newly uh, discovered documents. <coughs> The Chamber wishes to ensure that the parties understand that the purpose of requiring notification to the parties by way of advance uh, courtesy copies uh, of material that does not comply with Rule 87 is to allow all of the parties and the Chamber to understand the nature of the question that uh, is being, uh, uh, that the expert is being subjected to. Uh, to upload more than 1,100 documents makes this advanced courtesy notice uh, of benefit at all. Uh, consequently, uh, the Chamber wishes to remind the parties that they should upload very few documents in this category. Uh, no more than five to ten such documents and at least two weeks in advance of the examination to enable the Chamber and the parties to have an opportunity to review those documents. The ruling yesterday also clarified that uh, the documents themselves cannot be used as if they were put before the had already been put before the chamber. It is only the contents or the substance of those documents that can be used in examining the uh, experts. Consequently, the chamber will not allow any quotes from such documents, and nor will identity Finally, such documents, if they are used as the basis for questioning uh, and reviews, uh, must be relevant to issues in case 002-001. Uh, the President will not allow any questioning that he rules is irrelevant or repetitious. In a second ruling uh, that the Chamber wishes me to uh, explain today, the lead co-lawyers have been given the second half of this morning and this afternoon for its uh, examination of the expert. 
Thank you, Mr. President, and good morning to everyone. Um, I've understood the uh, ruling by um, Judge Cartwright well, just for the record and just for clarification. Um, Judge Cartwright was referring to uh, 1,100 documents that apparently have been uh, uploaded on the, um, onto the system. I'm not sure who would have done that, but it's certainly not something that has been done by our team, or certainly not something that has been done on purpose by our team. If it has happened, it's a glitch. We have never meant to upload any more documents than uh, the ones we have already announced in our Rule 87 for request. So if something has gone wrong software-wise, I do apologize, but we are not aware of any 1,100 documents, and we would certainly not have attempted to do so. So I will check in the break if um, we are to blame for that. If so, uh, my apologies, but uh, certainly this was not a uh, uh, ដោយសមាជិកស្រីថាយើងខ្ញុំមិនមានចិត្តจุนเตอร์กรมดำนางสาปริญญาดำไปบรรทอการตั้งธรรมโนดในดาวจิปุ๊บเนี่ยจำเรียงสมชื่อ Thank you Mr. President ดำนางสาปริญญาสมกุลลุกปฏิญ Just because um, time is precious, time is precious. I, I want to seek a brief clarification We were uh, granted yesterday an hour and a half to conclude our examination which would take us uh, 15 minutes after the break um, are we permitted to continue for 15 minutes after the break? Um, just so I can uh, in advance. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank your honours. And good morning, Professor. Thank you for coming back. Um, as you heard, we will conclude our examination in um, an hour and a half of real time. And uh, again, we'll, we'll try and be as, as expeditious as we can. We discussed yesterday the establishment and mission of S21 and some aspects of its operation, including the, the format of the confessions and other documents you reviewed from the S21 archive. Um, by way of um, Providing a context for the rest of um, the, the subtopics I wish to examine with you. Um, I wish to ask you first to give us a brief, very brief overview um, of what you describe as the two broad purges um, occurring in uh, 75 to 76. And then after 76, I will read the relevant passages from your book from S21, just so that everyone, everyone understands what your uh, analysis of this This is document D108-50-1.4. Khmer ERN is 0019-1880. The English ERN is 
ปีมูลเดี๋ยวยี่ห้อนึงบรรจุนไอกระสาจิตราชินเดินลงสถาจาบารังเลียนคือโซนโซนใบปรามปรามปีใบมวยมวยยี่ห้อนึงอ่าน brief passages การดอกสลองเคลย์มวยเจนคือจะเพิ่มบอกลูกมวยนี่ quote การดอกสลองตรงใด And if we could have the Khmer version on the screen for the public, that would be appreciated. The purges conducted by the party center and enacted at S21 can be broken into two broad phases. The first lasted from September 1975 until September 1976. The second extended until the collapse of DK. Most of those targeted in the first wave of purges were civilian and military officials affiliated with the defunct Lon Nol regime. In the backwash of victory, thousands of these people were rounded up and killed. And skipping one sentence, then a little bit further down, the 1975 killings in DK, like re-education in Vietnam, were ordered from the top. The next passage which builds on this topic is just a little bit further down, and I quote, in Cambodia, the killing campaign was curtailed in June 1975 by the party center. Soon afterward, more formal and more extensively documented procedures for, detailing, for dealing with enemies centered on Santabal came into effect. Professor, if I could ask you to briefly elaborate on your conclusions that the, the rounding up and killing of those associated with the Lon Nol regime was occurring, uh, I think you say, up to about June 75, and that thereafter uh, a different set of procedures uh, came into force. Could you elaborate as to how you came to those conclusions and what, um, uh, what significant events reflect uh, uh, this shift? Yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, the uh, purges against the uh, uh, former members of the Lon Nol Government and army are fully uh, testified to in uh, refugee reports uh, and in uh, some uh, DK documents, many of which were not available to me when I wrote this book, but they confirmed the finding that I've already put in via uh, refugee reports, uh, interviews that have been conducted in the early 80s, published work by uh, other writers and so on. It's a pretty well-known uh, uh, first phase uh, compared by uh, the American writer Noam Chomsky to the revenge killings that occurred in France at the end of World War II. In other words, uh, sort of don't worry about it, this happens all the time kind of uh, explanation. Uh, I think many more lives were involved in terms of the relative sizes of France and uh, Cambodia, but uh, the point is this was a kind of... Uh, vendetta that was called uh, pulled up short uh, by the regime. Later on, of course, uh, particularly in the uh, provincial prisons, uh, there's evidence that if new people were discovered to have been in the Lon Nol Army, this was enough information to pull them out of the workforce, put them into the prison, and generally, in many cases, to have them executed. So informally, it continued, formally, it stopped. Thank you, Professor. Moving on to your um, discussion of, the, of what you describe as the ideology of democratic Cambodia, which uh, relates to uh, the treatment of enemies. Uh, this is again in Voices from S21, Khmer ERN 00191. Nine seven six and French ERN zero zero three five seven three nine three. If we could have the 
Khmer passage the page on the screen, the passage is brief. It states the following. The ideology of democratic Cambodia, as we have seen, was premised on continuous class warfare and continuous revolution. Quote, enemies, unquote, were everywhere and needed to be destroyed. Some were poised along Cambodia's borders, others were farther off. Still others were, quote, buried inside the party, borrowing from within. Enemies often came disguised as friends. To ferret them out, extreme measures needed to be taken. I wish to show you now a excerpt from a revolutionary flag magazine which we discussed in your book, the Tragedy of Cambodian History. This is the August 1975 issue, document number E3-5. And I just want to read a couple of passages and see if you consider them in any way relevant for the purposes of this, uh, discussion. Khmer ERN 0006334101. English ERN 0040105012 and French ERN 0053897627. This is a very long document. I'm only going to read uh, three brief passages. Quote, because of this, our army must fulfill the mission of defending the country with high and constant revolutionary vigilance. The next passage, uh, two sentences down. That is, as for defending Phnom Penh and smashing espionage groups and smashing saboteurs that want to wreck and destroy our revolution, we will continue to smash the defeated enemy remnants to consolidate our victory. And finally, briefly, uh, further down from that, quote, that is, the external enemies and the internal enemies still exist. Class combat and national people's combat still exist. The passages that I've read uh, discuss revolutionary vigilance and class combat and the need to smash the are these passages in any way relevant to your discussion of the concept of continuous class warfare and enemies that need to be ferreted out? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask a question. Indeed, they do, uh, and that's why I cited them in my book. Um, it seems to me this is a very forthright statement of objectives, uh, a very consistent statement of objectives. It's interesting, <coughs> rereading the document after several years, um, that the phrase internal enemies already occurs in December 75. I mean, this is obviously something that they have been in their um, uh, quiver, if you like, a weapon that they could use for a long time. But in terms of the approaches against internal enemies, these hadn't even started, but the passage is urging its readers uh, or listeners it was delivered as a speech originally to be vigilant against uh, internal enemies. Uh, a key point that I should have made perhaps yesterday, these are undefined. So <laughs> the point is, as I sit here, I'm surrounded by potential internal enemies. As you stand there, you are surrounded by no one in the room is to be intrinsically trusted. This produces a sort of, um, if you like, frothy atmosphere of decay. If they said decay, the internal enemies will have been proved through evidence to have done such as that, that makes it much clearer. But they say they're out there. It's like the French phrase, a counter-revolutionary. Who knows who they are? And this is menacing and uh, very helpful to the regime to keep everybody off balance. And just so that we're clear, on who's, based on your research, on whose behalf is the revolutionary flag written or, or whose messages does it represent? Thank you. 
This is a, uh, a uh, periodical whose uh, readership is reserved to uh, party members, whose articles are uh, written by uh, high-ranking party members or articles reflect speeches delivered by high-ranking party members, generally not named uh, uh, as, uh, as such. Thank you. Now, you discussed with Judge Cartwright on Wednesday the significance of the 30th of March 1976 decision um, and, and the decision uh, on the right to smash in that document, so I don't propose to um, deal with it, um, but it is a nice um, point of reference as we move into 1976, and I wish to show you uh, another uh, issue of the revolutionary flag and see if you can consider for us what the, the messages conveyed reflect in terms of policy. This is document E3-4. It is the revolutionary flag of July 1976. The Khmer ERN is 0006292. The English ERN is 0026892. And the French ERN is 0034980980. If we could pass a hard copy to the professor, just to make it easier. Um, if you look for the ERN, the passage ends, or rather the digits end with 927. Quote, but assessing another aspect, objectively and subjectively, objectively, there are enemies. And then two sentences below. The aspect of harassment is routine. They wreck us by every means, from inside and from outside. But they are unable to attack us from outside, so they attack from within. To attack us from within, they must attack the line, cause turmoil in the line inside the party, inside the army, inside our people, so they will be easy to split. The next passage uh, before I ask you some questions from this document is at Khmer ERN 0062935. English ERN 00268938 and French 00349989. Again, a brief passage, quote, in the past, a large number of the inductions in the party were proper. But a fairly large number were improperly inducted, especially in 70 to 71. Therefore, many opportunistic elements entered, but the party closed the doors and purged in brackets screened to the maximum. And skipping one sentence, the, the following sentence reads, in doing so, experience has shown that it is imperative to grasp the biographies. If the biographies are unclear, even though the candidates are good, do not yet induct them. Be vigilant regarding the CIA. They have infiltrated. What, if anything, does this reflect uh, in terms of the uh, view on enemies as they relate to the regime at this, at this point in time? Well, <coughs> this uh, kind of distressing paragraph is singling out by name, uh, well, not by specific name, but by identifi identifying enemies as 
of people who have already been inducted into the CPK. Now, this was not, we don't have exact party figures, but this was not hundreds of thousands of people. This was at most uh, 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 tens of thousands. Obviously, during the Civil War, as it became uh, more a Khmer Rouge operation rather than a joint Vietnamese Khmer operation uh, on the, uh, against the Lomel regime, uh, the Khmer Rouge quite sensibly needed to develop a mem a cadre that they could trust. By, and one aspect of this was by inducting them into the CPK so they could become military uh, officers and uh, not a phrase they use, but le military leaders, uh, potential administrators, and so on. So it seems, I don't know, I, I haven't run into other documentary evidence of their rushing these members uh, into the party. But it seems that this might be a perfectly uh, truthful passage. They're worried that they had some people, uh, they brought some people in whose biographies were not sufficiently examined. And this is understandable under wartime conditions. Uh, somebody could wander in and say, I'm a poor peasant, and then three years later they find this person was a different class origin or had a relative working for Lon Nol. So you have to rescreen uh, uh, re these people. Uh, the date of the uh, issue confirms what, what has been discussed already, that there's this shunt toward internal enemies away from former enemies. Internal enemies now become the important target of uh, DK rather than Lon Nol remnants, as they're called. You discussed yesterday that uh, you have looked at um, the biographies of guards of the staff at S21. Um, the passage that we just read stresses the, the imperative to grasp, that it is imperative to grasp, grasp the biographies. What is your understanding of how biographies were used by the regime? Biographies were used extensively in the regime. This is a new genre in Cambodian literature, basically. I mean, everybody in the party had to prepare uh, biographies for use in uh, study sessions. We have some biographical passages about the leaders of the party, including Paul Pot, that uh, occur in one of the confessions. Obviously, uh, all this detail must have been drawn from documents and the uh, person who was confessing it. Uh, this accurate information that can be checked from other sources. Uh, Biographies uh, were the key. They figured, uh, the GK figured that elements of your past life would be indicative of how you would operate. Uh, in other words, if you were a middle peasant, you were less likely to be a loyal communist than if you were a poor peasant. If you had any relatives in the Lon Nol regime or had uh, perhaps been a monk for any period of time, uh, these were made you more questionable, less pure. So they tried to dredge up this information. Uh, and uh, these biographies, even among people who were not accused of crimes, were uh, repeatedly uh, requested to see if there are any changes or if you had uh, omitted so detail. It's a very important uh, weapon of the, uh, of the regime, or uh, let's not, get, not use such a strong word, let's say a tool. It was a tool the regime used to maintain control and to find out who the people were that they were using as their uh, representatives. Thank you, Professor. Now, moving on to another area which you deal with in some detail in the Voices from S21, and it is the events of the early 1976, and in particular, um, the incident, an incident in Siem Reap, an explosion in Siem Reap, and also explosions in Phnom Penh. Um, are you able to give us a, a brief overview of the relevance of those events as you saw them, or would you prefer me to read the passages first and then have you expand? I'm just thinking what is going to work better in just some time. 
Well, if I don't talk too much, so it's better if I just quickly go over it. Uh, the explosion in Simriap, no one's ever been able to explain this. Uh, scholars have worked on what it might have been. Uh, it might have been an accidental explosion and an ammunition dump. Some uh, think it might have been a Thai air raid. Uh, there's no evidence at all this was uh, a, a crime uh, produced uh, by the uh, local authorities, although it was an event that made the regime uh, nervous because something had happened that was not supposed to happen. In Kampen, <coughs> again, there was an, a grenade explosion somewhere near the royal palace. And as we've heard earlier, no, we haven't heard earlier. <laughs> the, Places where the leaders of the party lived and worked were, were, were quite close to the royal palace. So if a grenade explodes in the royal palace, and this, all these kind of things were very severely controlled, they assumed this meant an, an, an attack on the regime rather than a grenade exploding in the royal palace. The, the military body serving in Phnom Penh, uh, the numbers in my book, uh, was a body of troops drawn from the east uh, and fought in the east during the Civil War, was commanded by people who had been a cadre in the east. And so it was felt that these soldiers were acting, but who had set off the grenade, acting on the authority of an officer in that unit who was from the east and opposed to the regime. This turns the whole DK searchlight onto the east, which they'd always been suspicious, because that's the part of Cambodia that borders Vietnam, and particularly on the officers of this particular military unit. So that's what kicked it all off. And as I said later, earlier, S-21 at the high school was established very quickly after, this, after this event and its uh, aftermath. Thank you very much for that brief and, and, and comprehensive You've discussed the focus on the East, as you uh, found in your books. Um, is there any relevance, um, or rather, I'll rephrase that, um, looking at the arrest of a cadre called Khoi Khun, who we also discussed in your book. Um, what, if any, significance does that arrest have in light of these events? I think that was really a third wave of purges. I don't think it's a, it was a, about a year later. It's not directly related uh, in my mind. Uh, we, th this was beginning to be a purge of what seemed to be a purge of intellectuals in the party, uh, people who were connected with Khoi Thu and who had been to the Lisei Sisawat with many of the other uh, members, uh, high-ranking members. Uh, the purges against the Eastern, uh, Eastern military people went on through, through 1976. In 77, there's a shift uh, uh, toward purging cadre in uh, parts of the country where conditions are uh, very bad and where the center is, maybe belatedly, learning how bad the situation is, so they're starting to turn on cadre in these areas. Uh, the northern zone uh, was an area that seemed to have some difficulties. Uh, Khoi Tuan had been in charge of that zone. Now, it may well be, this is never clear, that they were going after him for some other reasons. But it, it, it starts off a rolling barrage of attacks on the productive, or the supposedly productive parts of the country, uh, particularly in the Northwest, that uh, rolls on through 1977. And Khoi and his associates uh, start to be, I mean, this, the people who get arrested in, connected with his arrest, in connection with his arrest uh, tend to be people uh, higher up in the uh, party apparatus than the soldiers and military officials arrested in that eastern zone first, first set of purges. So the Khoi kicked off a uh, purge is very significant. His confession runs to, I think, 800 pages, uh, a series of confessions. He was treated uh, very, uh, apparently, according to Doit, very well at first. He was told not to be treated, don't torture him, just ask him questions and so on. Oh, it's a crucial, another, it's another shunt, another turning point. Thank you.
Saprinya semakun. Now you've just referred to the arrests of people associated with Roka Chap Khun, Manu Kaya Chok Sai Koi Thun. And I wish to refer to two passages in the voices from S21, which deal with one of those people. Just for the record, again, document 108-50-1.4. The Khmer ERN is 0-1-9-1-9-0-0. The English ERN is 0-1-9-2-7-4-2-4-3. And French 0-0-3-5-7-2-2. I see you have been able to look at two passages that appear relevant to the topic we're discussing. Quote, two weeks after Khoi Thun's arrest, Duan was brought into S21. Duan had worked closely with Thun in the civil war and had replaced him briefly as commerce secretary. In 1975, he became the administrative officer of Office 870, the CPK's central committee. And the next passage that relates, quote, of the prisoners arrested so far, with the possible exception of Ney Saran, Dawn was the closest to the party centre, and the importance of his position in Office 870 is confirmed by the fact that he was replaced by Q. Sampan, DK's ostensible chief of state. It is possible, as Hedda has argued, that Q. Sampan played a key role in Dawn's downfall. He was certainly the major beneficiary. Looking at these passages, I don't want to speculate on given that we're not referring to hard evidence on Mr. Q. Sampan's alleged role. I wish to take a step back and look at the way in which you consider Dawn's seniority. Could you expand briefly on that on that short passage where you say that the importance of Dawn's position in Office 870 is confirmed by the fact of his replacement by Q. Sampan. ຈັດນັ້ນຄືຖ້າຄືບັນຈະຖ້າແນ່ມົກຊຸມນຸກກອດຄືຊິມົນຸກສໍາຄັນໄດ້ໂດຍຊິຄິວສຸມພອນນີ
looking at another arrest which you discussed in some detail in your book was from S21. You look at the treatment of Hunim, alias Pais, who was the Minister of Information and Propaganda. And this is what you say. This is what you say. This is what you say. English ERN 00192743 and French ERN 00357 Born into a poor peasant family in Kampong Cham in 1930, Hunim overlapped with Kusampong and missed overlapping with Salot Sa at school in Kampong Cham. First of all, could you describe for us the role Hunim played in the past over the years and what significance, if any, can be attached to the arrest of an individual at this level of the authority structure? We're just to refresh some memories. Hunim was, of course, one of the so-called three ghosts who were allegedly uh, leading the, uh, go the front government of uh, Sinu. Uh, the other two ghosts were who you and was assumed to be uh, uh, dead, and of course Kyu uh, <coughs> That three ghosts to pass, I don't think, was, had anything to do with his being arrested. In his confession, he doesn't uh, go through that period of his life. That's not what he's being blamed for, uh, what he was being uh, blamed for. In, intrinsically was his association with other people who had already come to S21. By implication, uh, he was being blamed for situations, uh, particularly in the Northwest, uh, which, as I said earlier, had been uh, staffed with <coughs> reasonably un uh, cadre not familiar with the region and peopled by new people. It was obviously a, 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 a poor situation uh, to, developed in the Northwest, as we've, we've discussed. Um, <coughs> so this is a even more of an of a intellectual and a front person than uh, Koi Tuan. His life in the party had been completely concealed in the 1960s. Sinuk went after him in a kind of a, a, a targeted him because he was, had close ties with the Chinese community in Kampan. In the 1960s, they were going through a Maoist phase, and Hunim was related, related to Sinuk. Uh, uh, one of the reasons he fled to the countryside, the uh, same as uh, Kyu Sampan did, in 67, that he'd been targeted by Sinuk as one of the enemies of the country because of his association with the Chinese. So his past is pretty well open. And this is why I think, um, or certainly why, his confession was singled out by Kiernan and Chan Tu Bua before we wrote that book as one that should get into the public eye because people had heard of him before. This is a, a clear rich figure that people have remembered from his three ghost past. And uh, so his confession was, is in the back of Robot Plans of Future in English. It's one of the few confessions that exists in full in English and publication. Thank you, Professor. Looking at another group that you um, deal with in your book, another group of um, victims, this is at Invoices from S21 and Khmer ERN 00191897-8. English ERN 00192739-740 and French ERN 00357-328. Uh, this, this 
This particular section is headed yeah. purging Mate, diplomats and intellectuals. Um, you, 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 uh, I will uh, skip uh, a number of passages in the interest of time, but you discuss the uh, inauguration of the, the four-year plan in December 76, as well as the raid into um, Vietnam in early 1977. The passage that, is, um, that I wish to read out and, and ask you about is the following. Quote, as DK prepared itself uh, for war, the CPK also purged people into diplomatic service, and the Ministry uh, of Foreign Affairs suspected uh, of being, quote, pro-Soviet or pro-Vietnamese. Prominent victims included the DK ambassador to Vietnam, Cien An, and Hak Sien Le Ni, a foreign ministry official accused of founding yet another rival communist party with Soviet encouragement in the 1960s. Several other diplomats were also rounded up. These punitive measures also reflected the distrust felt within the party center for anyone except themselves who had had professional training, extensive residence overseas, or contacts with non-Khmer. Could you expand for us on this, uh, on the effects of this um, apparent focus on pro-Soviet or pro-Vietnamese uh, elements as it relates to the uh, diplomatic corps and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Yeah, the <coughs> The regime didn't uh, really trust anybody who had unmonitored periods of activity. This is particularly people who lived for any length of time overseas. People selected for uh, diplomatic service had often, by definition, were living overseas, uh, and others uh, <coughs> had had experience elsewhere. Um, I'm not sure uh, that this purges, which were not a, because the foreign ministry diplomatic corps was so small, for example, uh, were as significant uh, as some of the purges of the Northwest or the, uh, or the uh, East uh, and so on at uh, other uh, times. Uh, but uh, I think the uh, Khmer Rouge wanted to make sure uh, in the 1877 they were breaking uh, relations uh, with uh, Vietnam uh, in any uh, case uh, that uh, the people, uh, the handful uh, of people uh, that they had overseas, uh, Korea, uh, North Korea, uh, China, uh, Vietnam, uh, and Laos, uh, were people they could uh, trust. They pulled the Vietnam man back and when he went through S-21 uh, and they executed him. Uh, the Lao person stayed in place, I think. The Chinese people were not pulled back. But people who had been diplomats before under Funk and Grunken were allowed to work in uh, B-1 because they had this experience were started to be suspe suspected. Now, just considering arrests from within B-1 and from these diplomatic posts, are you able to opine uh, looking at the CPK authority structure, um, which authorities um, or which bodies, if any, would have had authority to uh, authorize such, such arrests? There's no... Uh, Hardly ever in Cambodia is there a smoking gun for this sort of decision. But uh, diplomats are arrested uh, from the diplomatic corps or from inside the ranks of B1. These arrests had to have met the approval or at least come to the knowledge of Yang Suri, who was foreign minister. They would, they would, people would not be coming to the foreign ministry at night and snatching officials out from under him. He was advised whether he himself said that we should, that's what we don't know. We know these people left the foreign ministry. We know he was trusted by the regime. We know the way things work, that he would certainly have been informed. There are some confessions that say one copy sent to Brother Van, who be informed about something that was in his interest as a foreign affairs person or whatever. So awareness would be there that he was the authority, you can't say that. The authority is always at the top. But then, as I've said so many times, the top is a whole bunch of people. It's not a wait till the, till the head guy signs the... No, no, the 
collective decisions all the time. And that would be, uh, so you can't name a name as to who authorized the arrest, but you can say certainly that the industry was aware of these, and possibly there was no in his, uh, you know, uh, defense is not the word I want to use, but as a sort of uh, extenuating circumstance, there was no way he could say, don't arrest them, don't do that, unless there are cases when this happened and we don't know about them. That's, that's what I have to say. And just coming back to the idea. ยายบ้านยืดเชียงนี้มันติ๊กอย่าเลื่อนเพจอย่าเลื่อนเพจเนี่ยบ่แปรบ่อัตตอนเนี่ยบ่อสมชื่อมาต่อลงนำนางทาง
cleaning out the uh, party in the Northwest and the intellectuals and so on, the previous purges. But they had to shift to uh, concentrating on people who were either ethnic Vietnamese or were uh, involved in some way with what had in fact been a severe defeat for the Khmer Rouge in the sense that the Vietnamese came in, stayed, and withdrew rather than came in and were thrown out by the Cambodian army. The second thing it made them uh, uh, consider, I think, is that their, I don't think they ever said anything about this in public, so this is supposition, that their raid, cross-border raids into Vietnam in 1977 had been counterproductive. These were, in fact, what had provoked the Vietnamese. We're pretty sure of that through documentary evidence and had not had the results that had been wished by the regime. So in 78, in fact, these cross-border raids uh, are not as vicious as they were in 77. Um, it's starting to be an opening out and a breaking down of the uh, DK regime because of this uh, war uh, with Vietnam. This was what brought the regime uh, down, and I think the provoked the level of fear and attention that these purges indicate. Thank you. Um, before we move on to um, the, the uh, again, latter uh, phases of, of these purges, um, and, and the, uh, an issue you've already raised earlier, um, the impact on the East Zone, I wanted to um, briefly consider whether <coughs> some of the public statements um, by the regime in the 1977 period um, are in any way relevant for the purposes of, of the discussion of, of enemies. The document I wish to show to you is document E3 slash 201. It is a anniversary speech delivered or attributed to Mr. Ki Sampong on the 15th of April 1977. The relevant passage in Khmer is 00292805. The English 00419513. And we'll pass that passage to you, Professor, in hard copy. In French, 00612166. And the, the passage reads as follows. Quote, however, we must, and just before I continue, if I could ask for the Khmer version to be on the screen, thank you. However, we must carry on the task of defending our democratic Cambodia, protecting our worker peasant administration, and preserving the fruits of our Cambodian revolution by resolutely suppressing all categories of enemies, preventing them from committing aggression, interference, or subversion against us. We must wipe out the enemy in our capacity as masters of the situation, following the lines of domestic policy, foreign policy, and military policy of our revolutionary organization. Everything must be done neatly and thoroughly. We must not become absent-minded, absent careless, or forgetful because of past victories. And I'll stop there. The reason um, I'm, I'm turning to this passage is because it is a, apparently a public statement. Um, and I wish to... Um, seek your expert opinion on whether or not these, these words, the, this passage, um, in any way reflect the, the policy of the party that we've been discussing. I, I think the passage fully reflects party policy. I mean, it's a, it's a restatement of themes and even sentences and phrases we've been hearing for the last three days. Thank you, and I'm particularly grateful for uh, your, your brief answers.
Um, you already touched on the uh, purges of the north and the northwest. Um, time is precious and, and we, we don't have uh, enough time to go into a great amount of detail. Um, but what I wanted to turn to is the, um, what you describe as the, as the purge of the east zone. You've already touched on this uh, a little bit. Um, one of the reasons I wish to uh, seek uh, further um, opinions from you is because you describe it as a significant, uh, uh, significant um, and I'm going to read one passage from Voices from S21 and ask you to expand or describe for us um, what that purge entails. This is at Khmer ERM 0019910. To 00191913, English ERN 00192752753, and French ERN 00357341. It's a long uh, section, so I will just see if I can focus on the most important passages. You first discussed the the arrest of West Zone Secretary Chu Chet um, and the hospitalization at the time of East Zone Secretary Sao Pim. Um, the, the passage that then follows is um, reads, quote, the party center then embarked on a wholesale purge of cadre in the Eastern Zone. In April 1978, so many were brought into S21 that some of the trucks bearing prisoners had to be turned away. The prisoners were presumably taken off to be killed without any interrogations. The purges were conducted by senior members of the CPK, led by Son Sen, and supported by loyal troops dispatched from the southwest zone and the central zone under Kekmok. Professor, you mentioned earlier the early suspicions of the party center in 1978 as they relate to the east zone. Um, could you expand uh, on your conclusions as to what led to this purge and what its effect was on, on the zone? I think uh, what led to the ហើយខ្ញុំគិតថាបាទលើតទៅសំជើញលុងមួយទៅពីសូមអរគុណលោកធានសូមគោរពលោកសិក្សាក្រមសួស្ដីសហវិទ្យាវរេញ្ញាអ
been doing so. Uh, the use of the word, I think. Well, when you call an expert witness, you call him to give expert opinions. When one gives expert opinions, he or she thinks, and that's what the professor is doing, I think. Uh, it is nonsensical to suggest that he can't use a word that, in fact, uh, describe the process that we're asking him to undertake. បាទសេចក្តីចំទោសរបស់មេត្តាវីជាតិការពារក្តីឲ្យលោកអៀងទរីគ្មានបរិស័ទភាពការ <coughs> ກັດມັນឲ្យមានការបង្ហាញនៅអត្តនោមត្តរបស់ខ្លួនចំពោះសាក់ស័យសាក់ស័យមិនអាចធ្វើដូចជាអ្នកជំនាញទេអញ្
ที่พี่ยูสมานยัดมีจุนอภิจำลอยหรือเปล่าชั่วจับมัดจับมัดบ้างมัดเสมัดเสียสอมอสระเอ๊บกเชียวหนุ่งต่อจับมัดบ้างจีริคาสกสัจกันดาลดำบอลมาพายปีบ่เปียบ้างบาติบายุ่งสมอาปีชมวประวัติกรรมอภิรบอชมวัวกุ้งกินกุ้งกินบ่ากุ้งเสียสอเกอเงือบตะหายกินเสียสอเกอสะอีท้อมหนึ่งเนอบ่ากุ้งกินหายตึงเวทบ่ากุ้งกินหายอึงเวทบ่าออกกันบ่ Thank you, Mr. President. Thank my national colleague, um, Professor Chandler, taking them in the order that my colleague just read. Um, could you, and, and I will ask my colleagues to display the Khmer version of the document on the screen. The ERN is 0000543. Um, the English ERN 00185061. We will display the Khmer version on the screen. Professor, what we are. The AB unit could assist us with, so with displaying that on the screen. I think we have the right page and it would be appropriate uh, to also display. Thank you very much. Um, we're merely interested here in the annotation that you see appearing uh, and that is dated, I believe, the 11th of November 1977. If you could read that for us, Professor. No, no. It said, let me just get this thing again. Which one it is. Uh, two, two brother new and one copy. Thank you. Uh, let me just say one more thing. You asked me uh, last uh, evening, yesterday, to review these annotations. I just want to get on record that. I did review them yesterday, this morning, so I've, I've gone through the book. <laughs> so uh, I have seen them, and I'm ready to talk about them. Thank you. And I, and I, and I thank you for those, for those efforts, Professor. I know that we've placed significant demands on you. Um, if we could look at the second one, um, and here the annotation I'm interested in is a little bit longer. Um, this is... Uh, the confession of Chat Mid. The Khmer ERN is 0022640100. Um, and this is dated the 11th of November 1977. Read them in English. Uh, I'd appreciate if we can show that uh, page on the screen. The ERN is in Khmer 226401. I think it's ready for the ERN unit. Thank you. If you could read that uh, I, are you able to, to uh, uh, We're waiting for your microphone. Could we, could we please have the professor's microphone? Thank you. Uh, it's flattering to be, have it suggested that I can read Cambodian faster than I can read English. Uh, but I have checked the Khmer text as I was waiting for your question. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, one thing that is not perhaps absolutely clear, Pon was another official at S21, He's, this, and this is the handwriting of Derek, that's all been, uh, it's well known, it's been testified many times. So this is his, his advice, and the key point, I think, in, from our point of view is that 
uh, paragraph 2 does refer in uh, Roman numbers to uh, Brother 2. And Brother 2 is fairly well known to have been, or very well known to have been a one of the names uh, assumed by uh, Nunchia. So what is happening here, I think, is that as advised, would mean, I would almost certainly, this advice would have come from Nunchia to Son Sen and then down to, and then sends it down to his subordinates. So you have a, a chain of this uh, order to withdraw these names from the, from the list. Why they're to be withdrawn is not explained. Thank you. Um, moving on to the third uh, document. This one, um, this is the one that I only have in Khmer. Um, there's only an unofficial English translation, but I hope that you'll be able to um, summarize it for us. Um, this is document IS 5.41, also E3 slash 1565. It's the third confession, the third document that my colleague read out uh, the name if I could ask you, uh, there are, and if my colleagues could display that on the screen so that the public uh, can see what we're discussing, the Khmer ERN is 00017305, English being 00182773. There are a number of um, uh, uh, annotations on this document. If you could start by reading the annotations written that are, that are uh, circled in blue on the screen or and on your uh, copy. So my log may be exact. Da, our log by sa we mean pipe ngay suot chieng. Again, the handwriting is is not flawless, but or neither is mine. But I, I think this reads, which please all send to Brother Nguyen one copy. And it, uh, I mean, I'm saying that because I've seen that Chun Bong Nguyen phrase in that handwriting. Now, I don't know whose handwriting it is. <coughs> and if you could also read for us the annotation on the right hand side with uh, uh, paragraphs one and two. ไดซะเซเลมุลิปีนุพองไดรวมมาลงช่วยอ่านนัมเบอร์ 1 um, it gets unclear to me there. Uh, the, the last part of a, a certain amount uh, from, uh, come from sectors 33 and 35. I'm, I'm missing a thing here. Uh, from, 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 I think it's a unit 109, but I can't. I didn't bring my commodity dictionary with me, but that, that, that's what I think it means. Certainly the first part is this document is very clear. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you for, for attempting to read uh, the document for us. Um, just... Uh, to avoid any, any doubt, um, so far as these three documents, uh, as, as you, they're in, in two documents there are references to Brother Nguyen, and in one there is a reference to Brother Number Two. Um, could you, just so that we avoid any, any doubt on the record, uh, who are these references, uh, who do they relate to, and um, what, if anything, do they reflect about that person's role in relation to the confessions? Well, cer <coughs> certainly Bong Nguyen and uh, Bong Ti Pi were two expressions or names uh, used uh, by people when addressing documents to Nguyen Chia <coughs> and asking what his role was in these confessions. That's uh, difficult to describe. <coughs> Clearly, uh, there's no evidence in, in some cases of the annotations. There's no evidence, there's no notes in his writing that he's read that particular confession. And anyway, the copies that went to him have not survived. There's a note on one send a copy to 
Nguyen Chia, so another copy went off to him. But it's obvious that in the one that came back in Dutch handwriting, Brother, Brother Two, a title of Nguyen Chia, advises that. That meant that he'd certainly read that confession. Now, reading them uh, and having documents sent to him, all I can say is it certainly suggests that he was aware of the operations of S21. He worked closely throughout the regime with Son San, and that's all I can say is awareness. We can talk about awareness. I can't take the role any further than that. And, and, and I thank you for being uh, qualified in that respect. Um, if I can move on to uh, another document, this is D 288 slash 6.5.2.32. Um, it is a uh, from the file of an individual called So Kim An, alias May. Uh, the relevant Khmer ERN is 00227819. The English is 00284045. If just for the record, if you would be so kind to, to pronounce that name in Khmer, because I'm unable to provide a satisfactory pronunciation. He's uh, known as Acha, which is a, a, a uh, religious sort of uh, civilian official, Acha Mi, and his, uh, that's his uh, perhaps revolutionary name, and his real name is uh, So Kim An. Thank you. So I'm, I'm reading this in Khmer. It looks to me like So Tim An. I need to see what my your colleague thinks. It's not Kim, but Tim. That's a tall. That's not a. That's not a. Not a cold. So it's just a slight. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to delay, but it's just one. One gets the guy's name right. At the top of the Duke comments. This is all in Duke's wonderful clean handwriting. ກໍນໍເດສົມຊື່ອັນອໍລະບົດທຽນສົມຊື່ອັນສົນນາກາຕາມ <coughs> I'll ask my colleagues to place the Khmer uh, version on the screen. The ERN in Khmer is 00231321. I just want to make sure we have that right. Um, correction, I believe Khmer should be 00227819. Um, a translation of that appears in English on 0028405. In French, it should appear on 0080046. If we could have the um, that that first page, effectively, of this, of this document on the screen. And Professor, we have it in English and Khmer. Um, if you could. Um, Simply summarize what that says. We don't particularly need to read the entire passage. Um, we will move on to another passage that is a little bit relevant. Uh, <coughs> it's hard to do this uh, briefly, but it shows, I think, what the do document shows is the kind of detail that people went to uh, when a case had attracted higher attention. They just went back over it and made sure that all the testimony was as verifiable as they could make it. Not the testimony uh, necessarily of having been, if you like, a CIA agent, 
but certainly testify where this person came from, what people he knew, what position, how he was in a position to know those people. So there's an investigations were, were set, in, set in train by that. And looking at the last page um, of, of that extract from this file in, in Khmer, and uh, also this is the second page in English, um, I'm interested in item number three, where the word starts with suggestion. Could you read that uh, in English for us, please? Yes, please. So this, this is a, a case, one of the rare, but oh, fairly frequent, but uh, cases of, of, of Dwight passing the buck upstairs, as they say, please, Ankar, examine the case involving Acharme. Now, Dwight was not, as we knew from his other trial, was not in a position to speak directly to Pol Pot in his document, so I think what he's saying is to Hans, to Son Sen was the person he communicated with because it's, it's addressed to uh, beloved brother as usual, that, that he pass it on to someone <laughs> at the top. That's the way he leaves it, he leaves it unclear. So it needs further, further examination. Thank you. ថ្ងៃទៀតពីលើគាត់នោះសាព្រីញ៉ាសម្អកគុណបាទអរគុណអរគុណលោកអ្នកជំនាញបើឥឡូវនេះដល់មកមកពេលវេលាសំរំសម